Welcome to the Thin Places Travel Podcast, where we discuss places where the veil between this world and the eternal world is thin. I'm your host, Mindy Burgoyne. And I remember walking the roads in the nighttime and you could see through the tower, you could still see the amethyst glistening in the moonlight. And it's a big, fat, purple amethyst sitting in the Atlantic Ocean. In this episode, we'll focus on the question, what are thin places? I'll talk about two wonderful sites in counties Galway and Cork that are included in the journey of St. Gobnet and finding one's own place of resurrection. And we'll hear from a guest, Ruth O'Hagan, who is a spiritual teacher and healer from County Clare. Welcome to episode one of the Thin Places podcast. I'm Mindy Burgoyne, and this is the first of what we hope will be many episodes on mystical places to travel to. We might begin by telling you a little bit about who I am. I'm a travel writer and a tour operator, and my writing focus is mostly on places that nourish the mind, body, and spirit when traveling, places that stir the spirituality within a person, or mystical places, places that have a landscape of mystery. And I've been writing extensively about Ireland for years, Scotland, Wales. I have a great interest in Celtic spirituality. And I also am a tour operator, and I run tours to Ireland and other Celtic countries, uh, kind of looking at these mystical sites, interviewing local guides, trying to absorb the concept. And probably the best thing to do before we launch into this episode would be to try and maybe identify what thin places really are. Language does fail us when we try to describe something like this. There aren't words that adequately, I don't think there are words available that really can give us a fair picture of what we actually sense when standing in one of these rare places. So for the sake of what language we can use, The typical definition I give is that a thin place, and that's T-H-I-N, like opposite of fat or thick, a thin place is a place where the veil between this world and an eternal world, or the other world, or maybe a supernatural world, the veil between those two worlds is thin, and perhaps they bleed together, are fused together where you can't really tell the separation. That's kind of what we mean when we say thin places. They're characterized less by definition and more by experience. You know, many of the great mystics have written about sacred sites and how that sense of sacred space can change us and shift our capabilities for communication, understanding, spiritual growth. You know, we know this, but in simple terms, if you wanted to describe a thin place, it might be a place where you feel spiritually at home. You know, it's different for everybody, but I can tell you what other people have said. And I have interviewed scores and scores of people asking them, what is a thin place to you? How do you experience it? What advice would you give to somebody wanting to travel to mystical sites to get the full benefit? And there are real commonalities in responses between unrelated sources who would never meet and responses that came over, you know, over a period of years. So for a certain number of people to say the same things when they're completely unrelated, it kind of helps one to draw conclusions. So it's a very difficult thing for me to identify. Many people have tried to do it. Certainly the pre-Christian people in Ireland had a sense of this sacred space and this fusing of a supernatural world with the physical world. And that's what our focus kind of is. Certain things happen in thin places according to people who respond. One is that a sense of time just vanishes. One obviously doesn't realize this until the visit is over, but people will say they've been in a place and when they're ready to leave or go, they don't know if they've been there for 15 minutes or or an hour or longer because they were fully and completely present in that moment there. And when that happens, one does lose sense of time. I can tell you just a really quick story that has nothing to do about with these thin places, but it does have to do with this concept. There's a place near where I live on the eastern shore of the Chesapeake Bay that's very, very rural. It's way down in the marsh. Uh, There was an old legend about a man called the Cowman of Crowshurn. Crowshurn was the village. And people who live down there, and when I say people, I mean like 60 people, not a lot of people, over, you know, across a, a great marshy landscape. 
said they, they would see this wild man hanging with cows, you know, cattle, a few cattle here, a few cattle there. He had crazy hair and extremely leathery skin. He didn't have any clothes. He ran barefoot. Some people said he could be seen suckling the teats of a cow. Well, it turns out that this was a real person. And somebody actually found him when he was well into adulthood and discovered through communicating with him that he had been an orphan. He had been sent to live sort of as an indentured servant with a local family. They weren't kind to him, and he ran away as a child, a little child. And he lived in the marshes. He lived by himself for years, well into adulthood. And the person who found him helped set him up in a house and helped him with his language skills. And the one thing he said that he could not teach this guy is a concept of time and marking the hours. He said no matter how hard they tried, they gave him a watch, they tried to tell him, you know, people go to sleep at this time, they're up at that time, and he just could not understand the concept of marking hours out and into days, into months, into seasons, into years. And so it does kind of tell us what our civilized structure has done to us, instilling us within us this concept of time. And sometimes that concept of time makes us look too much at the past and desire too much in the future that we forget how to be fully present in the present and just let it sit. And when you're in a thin place, fully present in the moment, you lose track of time. It kind of uh, is like the guy in the woods who was always fully present and knew nothing different. So in a thin place, you might lose track of time. People say that they, prayers are answered. Questions they've had on their mind, when they really contemplate them in one of these thin places, well, you know, answers will suddenly appear. Synchronistic events will happen. You know, a person will wonder, have a thought, and then get some kind of sign that is an answer to the question that is on their heart. I know that I've had similar things like that happen to me in places that I would consider thin places. But the second thing I want to address about thin places is to ask you, the listener, to think about special places that you've been, and certainly they're everywhere. They're not just in Ireland or in Western Europe. But if you've ever been in one of these places where you think it is fused with the other world, you know, to ask yourself, do you think that this place was always like that? that the place itself is inherently charged with some kind of energy that makes it thin? Or do you think that our own minds can sort of convert a place? You know, I remember reading a travel article written by a very well-known travel writer who said he it was about thin places, and he said any place could be a thin place if you wanted it to be, you know, like an airport or a waiting area. If you become fully present, then that place can become a thin place and you can have thin moments. So that's one perspective. I'll certainly respect that. That's not the perspective that we really look through. I really believe in all these travels that there are places that are inherently thin. They are places that no matter who walks into them, maybe they have a rare energy or a rare charge or a high sort of vibrational energy, but people notice. And what you see, in, especially in these Western European countries, is that civilization after civilization you know, they'll ebb and flow, but they will keep the same sacred spaces, not necessarily relocate them. So we'll talk about one today, which is associated with a, a very, you know, well-known regional Irish saint, but it's likely that where that saint placed her monastic settlement was also formerly a pagan holy site. And then the other question we want to think about, besides are these places inherently thin, is how do people know? You know, what was it in the people of the day that caused them to choose certain places. And sometimes we find that people will feel a certain energy or vibration in a place that is unmarked, and they will later find out that it was a ritual site, or there is a, a mound there that is likely a, a tomb or the ruins of an old monastery. So those are questions to think about when you consider the definition of a thin place. The next question I like to raise is why Ireland? Why all this talk about Ireland? First, let's just consider Ireland geographically. It is a small country. It's about the size of South Carolina. I think it's 32,000 square miles. So that's right about South Carolina, a little smaller than Indiana, about the size of Maine. To give you a little perspective, France is about the size of Texas. You know, 200 and some square thousand miles. Ireland would be one fourth the size, say, of New Mexico. So it's a relatively small country. 
And I'll tell you, I was drawn to Ireland by these sites, by these places. I would find one and I'd want to find another one. I'd want to return to some of the great sites I had been to because they were just so powerful. And then I'd want to find new ones. And Ireland is littered with these sites. Um, and in my experience, and I have traveled to other countries, visiting thin places. I've been to Scotland, Wales, England, Germany, France, certainly all over the United States. But Ireland not only has more sites visible, but there is an inherent sort of sense in the Irish people or in the Irish consciousness that respects or reveres sacred sites. They don't even, I, you know, they don't even know this, I don't think. I, I think to a degree, Irish people might know it, but to, to demonstrate what I mean, you know, I've asked many a farmer, well, many a farmer, maybe a half a dozen about the lone bush in the field, the hawthorn tree, that they don't knock down when they're plowing or that they protect. You know, they've got a big field. This field is, you know, their livelihood. And yet they won't disturb one lone bush or one particular tree. And if you ask them if they believe in fairy trees, every one that I have ever talked to without exception has said, of course not, that's superstition. Most Irish people that I ask that question of really do chalk it up to superstition. And I believe they believe that. I don't think they're covering anything up. I think that really is their true sense. However, they will not cut down the bush. They won't disturb the sacred site, whether it's, whether it's a respect or a fear or who knows, but they will not disturb it for the most part. Ireland is one of the few places you can drive around and you'll see, you know, the remnants of a 13th century square tower in a farmer's field. And it, it isn't anything special. You might not even know who that tower belonged to or if it belonged to anybody significant, but it's an old structure and it might be half falling down. But, you know, some of these people just don't remove them. They don't disturb dolmens. They're dolmens and standing stones and stone circles and mounds and passage tombs that are still being uncovered all over the landscape. I just recently went to Brittany, which is set in the western part of France, which is said to have much older megalithic structures than what are erected in Ireland. And they are very beautiful, and I loved Brittany. But when I came back to Ireland after a week in Brittany, I could just feel the difference. The landscape is much less tense. It's just much more free and open, and it flourishes with this kind of respect for the sacred in the landscape, a respect that is so driven into the Irish culture that you can't really separate it out and say, identify what it is. I can only see it because I compare it to other places. So that's why we talk a lot about Ireland, because there's a lot of stuff in Ireland. There's a lot of this kind of stuff. Certainly, it's not the only place, but it's going to be a focus for much of these early podcasts. So while we're on that, our format here is for me to do a little talking. You know, I could talk to you till you're dead. I love to talk. Then I'm going to highlight a site or two. Then we'll have a guest interview, and then I'll leave you with a tip. So this podcast episode, we're going to focus on the journey of St. Gobnet as the site. And the journey of St. Gobnet involves a phrase called place of resurrection. St. Gobnet is tied to that phrase. St. Gobnet was from West Cork. Actually, she was from County Clare. She settled in West Cork. But she's a 6th century saint in Ireland. Gobnet is G-O-B-N-A-I-T. It's the Irish version of Deborah or Abigail. St. Gobnet is not well known as far as my, uh, you know, I've said the name St. Gobnet to many Irish people, they never heard of her. But if they're from West Cork or Cork, they've heard of her because she's very prominent there. So just understanding the landscape of Munster, which is the southwestern province of Ireland, it has County Clare, County Kerry, and County Cork as part of it. And these are the places that Gobnet kind of traveled. Let me tell you a little bit about her story, and then I'll identify the sites that are associated with her. So St. Gobnet lived in County Clare, and she fled. No one knows what she was running away from. That's not part of the, the legend. I'm sure there's been speculation in some versions of the story. But basically, she was a young woman fleeing something uh, where her homeland was, and she went to the Aran Islands. The Aran Islands are out in on the, off the, the western coast of County Galway, very near to where Galway joins County Clare. There are three Aran Islands, Inishir, Inishman, and Inishmore. 
Inishmore is the largest of the islands, and that's the one most associated with tourists. Inishir is the smallest and the closest, and that is the island where St. Gobnet took refuge. So she was uh, a great lover of the island of Inishir, and she set up a little monastic community there. And these islands were associated with early Christian mystics way back when. Um, but the legend goes that at one point, St. Gobnet had a very vivid dream. And in the dream, the, an angel told her that she was to leave Inishir, that it could no longer be her place of refuge. It was a safe place for a time, but she needed to go on a journey and find her true place of resurrection. And the dream was so real to St. Gobnet that she actually did leave Inishir and left her community to set out to find her place of resurrection. So I'm going to stop the story right there and talk a little bit about Inishir as a site to visit. Because on our tour, which we have named Places of Resurrection, and it's one of the group tours that we offer, we follow this journey of St. Gobnet, and we start right on Inishir. So Inishir, um, you know, if you can imagine <clears throat> what it must be like to be out in the Atlantic Ocean as an island off the coast of Ireland, it's very wild. Um, Inishir is certainly an inhabited island, as are the other two, but its landscape is very rocky. You know, what you see when you, you survey the landscape is stones everywhere, stone walls and um, that just seem to go on forever. And there's the shoreline and the sea and the sky. So primarily that's the texture, stone, sea, sky, um, and the wind. You know, this wildness about Inishir. And it's stunningly beautiful. So when you come into the port there, Usually, there's, a, a, there's these pony and carts, these drivers of little carts with, led by, by ponies or horses, and they'll, for a few euro, or maybe I think it's 20 euro, they'll take you on a ride around the island. And I've biked the island, I've walked the island, and I've gone on one of these little carts, and this is a great first way to see in a share. Because, uh, you know, you... Probably the, the, you get to see more of the island in the time that you have, especially if you're coming in and going out the same day. But there's nothing that substitutes for the commentary of a local. You know, you could bike the island and see it on your own, but to be able to sit and listen to somebody that lives on the island and is a native tell you about the history and about the lifestyle there, uh, there's no substitute for that. It is a worthy experience to have. And that's what I would suggest, especially on the first visit. Um, and as you're going around the island, some of the major sites, or the sites worth stopping for, certainly are the churches of St. Gobnet and the Church of St. Kevin. So they're very different. St. Gobnet's church is much, um, much less ornate and stunning uh, when you first see it. It's just a little church ruin in a very small field, but it is said to be where St. Gobnet lived and where she founded her monastic community, and that church ruin um, is dedicated to her memory. And it, that's a great place to just stand and take in that story and remember it and um, just absorb the energy. It's beautiful. The Church of St. Kevin is much more dramatic because it's a bigger church. And this is not St. Kevin of Glendalough. This is, although some people say it is, but unlikely. This is another St. Kevin um, who also founded a community on Inishir. And the church at ruin is much bigger. But what is so strange about this site is that the church is in the ground. I believe we have um, in the show notes a link to a post that shows you pictures of that. So, you know, whether it was sort of um, erected in a, a dugout so as to stand secure against the island's winds, um, or whether it was erected on level ground and it just has been had all the sand blow over it to nearly bury it, or a combination of both. It's a, it's a stunning sight to behold because you're literally looking down into a hole at a church ruin and you can walk down into it and stand in it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the presence, uh, the presence and the energy in especially the, 
the nave of that church is almost palpable. So it's interesting to take a dousing rod down there or a pendulum and just sort of feel that pulsation of the energy at that site. Most of our guests feel it. And that's a, that's a good place to stop. It certainly is one that all the carts stop at. You might have to tell them to take you to St. Gobnitz, but St. Kevin's, you'll, you'll definitely see. There's a graveyard around it as well um, and a little um, oratory um, just off to the side. There's also a shipwreck and there's a castle and they're both very interesting. The beaches are beautiful and great to walk along. And up on the other side, the opposite side of the island, is a holy well dedicated to St. Enda, who was a great mystic and teacher who traversed those islands. Um, and if you mention that, you might get to go up there. The Inishir also has several places to have tea and grab something to eat um, and relax a bit if you're not after you've had uh, a chance to explore the island. And there is a there are accommodations if you want to stay overnight. So I just leave you with that vision of Inishir. You can take a ferry from Rossville or um, Doolin. If you if you go with O'Brien Cruises or O'Brien Shipping, um, they do a cruise out of Doolin that on the way back from Inishir goes below the cliffs of Moher. So these are those iconic cliffs that are on all the Irish advertisements, the cliffs of Moher. They're very tall, sheer cliffs, but this cruise allows you to see those cliffs from the sea, which is really beautiful. So it's a great way to see in a sheer and also see the cliffs of Moher from the sea. So that would be another thought if you're thinking of traveling out to Inishir. So back to Gobnet. Gobnet finds her refuge there and great comfort found some monastic community and has this dream or vision to travel to her place of resurrection. So what the dream said was, you must go on a journey to find your place of resurrection. You'll go until you find white nine white deer grazing. And when you see those nine white deer grazing, you will have found your place of resurrection. And that will be the end of your journey. And so it is said that St. Gobnet traveled all along the southern counties of Ireland. Um, and she finally came and stopped at a little village in West, in West Cork called Clondrohid. And there she saw three white deer grazing. So she suspected she was getting close. She followed those white deer to another village, the village of Ballymakira, and there she saw six white deer. And she followed the six white deer to another place where they joined three more white deer, and she saw all nine of them grazing on the banks of a river. And so she, it was there that she founded her monastic community, and that little uh, area is called Ballyvorney. Ballyvorney means town of the beloved and when it's translated. And she set up her uh, community there and she became legendary in the community as a great healer, a great protector, um, and somebody that the village relied on for guidance as well as um, spiritual and physical healing. In fact, there are parts of the legend that say when the plague came to Ireland, St. Gobnet with her staff carved a line around, you know, around the village and said and proclaimed it protected under God's protection against the plague and commanded that uh, the plague stay on the outside of that line. Um, and of course, the plague never hit belly morning. Um, there's also legends about uh, St. Gobnet and beekeeping, you know, the keeper of bees. She is the patron saint of beekeepers. And there's a story about invaders coming to Ballyvorney and St. Gobnet um, commanding the bees to attack the attackers and thus driving them away from Ballyvorney and leaving the village unharmed from the invaders. It's likely that St. Gobnet would have used the honey from the bees as part of um, her healing practices. You know, so she would have been a medicine woman or somebody that 
in the village, you know, back in the sixth century, there weren't official doctors. So she would have been one that people reached out to um, when they were sick, when their children were sick. And she was so loved by these people. And that love really carries over. The devotion to St. Gobnet is, is very rich in Ballyborn. Even people that don't go to church will still go to the Holy Well, or they'll still go and do the rounds of the church. There's a a strong sense of devotion, a lot of strong symbols associated with that site. Um, and in fact, the feast day of St. Gobnet is February 11th. And on February 11th, they have a big pattern day where, you know, the town comes out and they do, you know, the circular walking, praying the prayers. They, they get water from the holy well. Um, and there's a mass held in the local church and there is a uh, evidently a little doll, a wood carved uh, sort of image of it's carved in the image of Saint Gobnet, but it's it's said to be it dates back to medieval times. And they've had this this little statue for a long time, and they bring it out on February 11th, and people take pieces of ribbon um, and go to church, and when it comes time for the devotion. Uh, ritual for, to the saint and the relic or the icon or whatever you want to call this this statue, one by one, um, the pilgrims will touch their ribbon to the statue um, and then take it home as a, a sort of relic, a holy relic, and use it as part of a devotional practice. So there's lots of rituals um, associated with this site and with this saint. Um, and just a little bit about the site. If you go to Ballyborny, it's very easy to find because it's right on the main road. And anyone there would be able to direct you if you if you have trouble finding it. Um, the the what's in the area is the ruin of the church. So the church ruin is there. That probably dates back to the 14th century. So it would have been something built where St. Gobnet had her um, her community. It would have been built at a later time. There's even speculation that that site itself was an old pagan ritual site. So again, that gives that kind of um, credence to the belief that maybe, you know, there is something special about the place that is attractive to spiritual devotion or people that want to go to a place where they feel at home. Um, the church ruin is there. The church ruin has an image over the one of the doors of a Sheila and a gig, which is an old fertility symbol, a pagan fertility symbol. Um, the church also has, um, right near it, the tomb of St. Gobnet, where she is believed to be buried, and it's covered with large stone slabs and many tokens from people that are devoted. There is also, near the church, a holy well. The holy well has a massive tree right there, which is gorgeous, and it's covered with cluties or ribbons that people have left behind tied to the tree as a sign of their devotion. Um, and there's cups that you can use to drink the water or you can bring your own little vessel and take water from the holy well. It's very clear, it's very beautiful, um, and it is said to have healing properties. So people who um, want to gather that, you know, it's free. You can just go and, and scoop it up. Um, the, the holy well is, is one of the, it's probably the most um, traveled to site in the complex there with St. Gobnet. So Ballyvorney um, and the other stops along the way and in a sheer sites tied to St. Gobnet and her journey. But I just want to say a little something about West Cork. So you can find Cork City on any Irish map. It's along the southern end, kind of in the middle, more towards maybe the eastern middle of the country. But the county goes all the way over to County Kerry in the west along the Atlantic coast. And the western part of Cork is the really rural part of Ireland, of the Republic anyway. There are rural parts in Northern Ireland, but West Cork is very windy with the roads and not a lot of development. There's a whole lot of megaliths, uh, particularly stone circles. Um, it's, it, if you know, when you do your driving, you track your driving with Google Maps, like how long will it take me to get here or there? You find that miles take a lot longer to traverse in West Cork than they do in other parts of the country, just because the roads are all country back roads. It's a beautiful landscape, um, very untouched, and a great place to, uh, you know, a great place to travel, but you have to be prepared for um, things taking a little bit more time. So those are the two sites that I wanted to 
to highlight today, Inishir and Ballyvorney and their association with St. Gobnet and Thin Places. Um, I do have a guest today, and it is a good friend of mine. She is from County Clare. Her name is Ruth O'Hagan, and I'll introduce her in just a second. But Ruth is going to talk a little bit about um, the Irish concept of Thin Places and some of the places that she likes to see. So let's introduce Ruth and move on to that segment. Hi, I'm with Ruth O'Hagan today from County Clare. Ruth works in family psychology. She teaches and trains on master's and doctoral degree programs in university um, on the supervision and training of therapists and clinicians. And her background is deeply spiritual. She comes from a long line of natural healers. And her family's been in County Clare for thousands of years. She's a wife and a mother and is going to talk to us today about thin places and earth energy. Ruth has helped out on our tours and she's, a, she's wonderfully charismatic when it comes to these, the concept of thin places. Welcome, Ruth. I'm, I'm glad you were able to be with us. Thank you, Mindy. It's a joy. Oh, good. What, tell us about what your concept is of thin places. Thin Places to me, in my own felt sense, is a sense of coming home to yourself and you can't explain it. So you're in an environment and it can be any environment and there's a sense of togetherness with other people and other spaces beyond where the brain can actually understand in a very tangible way. Now, my sense of that is, for example, locally here in County Clare, in East Clare, we have a labyrinth. A labyrinth is, there are various types of labyrinths. You have the Chartres labyrinth, which is four quadrants. And what a labyrinth does is it mimics the dynamics of the brain. It's a very ancient, sacred ritual. And when when a labyrinth was designed... And, and, and written out onto the earth, and there are many of them around Ireland, and Chartres Cathedral in France is where the name of the complex labyrinth happens. When you walk these labyrinths, you're walking through the dynamic of many, many veils. So a labyrinth is quite a, a good example of where I would feel available both to the present, to the people and the places beyond what that present might mean, and that can often be in the future and in the past. So I feel very available to everything, to, I suppose, the oneness of the universe, not to sound too new agey about it, but there's a sense of availability to everything, good, bad or indifferent. And that the, the, uh, the separation between me and other places and other people is really reduced. And that can sometimes be useful when you're walking through a labyrinth because you walk it's like a prayer meditation and it takes the um it takes the figure of your brain and it allows you to journey in and journey out to an area or a context that you're currently focusing on so when you're in those spaces they act like a portal effectively between the availability of everything and yourself right so a thin place to you would be like that like mm. a portal yeah Right. Yeah. Okay. And what, how often, when have you first sensed thin places? You know, people that live in Ireland always amaze me because they're around these places all the time. And um, I wonder if it, uh, if it can get ordinary to them or do you always sense this? Yeah. You see the ordinariness of our experience of being Irish is that these things are normalized in our experience of ourselves every day. And depending on who you are, the focus then is brought certainly, in my experience, say, by my grandmother. Um, one of my grandmothers would take me walking as a very small child and educate me about the, uh, the leaves on the trees and the berries and the point of all of them and how we can use them. And in doing that, then, she would, you know, widen her information to me about the fairies and about the angels and all of those things so my mother and father were busy working and they, while they knew all that information she was the grandmother caring for me so she was available to direct me then so my awareness got directed I can remember definitely back to being three and walking the roads 
and then being taught to sing by her at that age. And I think my my I, I suppose when I look back on it, my body was becoming more focused and attuned um, to it back then. And, and it never left me. But I always had I suppose I came in I came in to this life not forgetting. So it was easy to align me uh, and my mother, both on both sides of my family. That would have been that would have been very present, that alignment and that attunement with what I suppose some people might call your divine spark. Mm-hmm. But certainly from an Irish perspective, if you other people wouldn't have that alignment at all and they wouldn't need it. And other people would go around and, you know, they'd see the beauty, but they'd just say, but that's just us and it's just ordinary. Whereas it took my husband when we moved back to Clare after living in Dublin for 20 years or I lived in Dublin for 20 years. It took my husband to see it because, of course, it was totally normalized to me, the beauty that we come from here in East Clare. Mm-hmm. He, was able to, he was able to see it with fresh eyes and see see what we do with it, how ordinary it is and how we're embodied in it every day. So that, for example, this morning I'm talking to my very good friend, the local priest, about our confirmation ritual coming up at the end of the week and holding a vital integrity around the energy of that and doing so in a way that if I didn't do it, you know, I'd have a pain in my heart. So that's ordinary. It might be a lot for other people, but that's ordinary for us. We have those permissions. Uh-huh. Can you tell me some of your favorite thin places? My favorite thin place in the whole wide world is the place where I met my husband, and that's Ackle Island, which is an, an island off the coast of Ireland on the west, right sitting in the Atlantic Ocean and it's an amethyst and there was amethyst mining going on there up until the 90s and I remember walking the roads in the nighttime and you could see through the tar you could still see the amethyst glistening in the moonlight and it's a big fat purple amethyst sitting in the Atlantic Ocean and I remember getting I suppose the greatest shock of my life which was when I looked at this man and I said oh my god and anything that I never needed again was gone away and I just looked at him and that was that so for me I have a great I suppose sense of my availability to my heart in that place and every time we go back which we do most years and bring the children I just just re-engage with that and then my husband has really re-engaged me then back here at home with Inish Kaltra, which is um, an island literally in my back garden um, because I have the River Shannon flowing behind my house. And it's one of the oldest ecclesiastical sites in Europe. And it is a place of, I just feel it just oozes the ancient sacred lessons of life. There was once an ecclesiastical university on it in the eighth century. Um, Brian Beru, one of the kings of Ireland, it belonged to his family for a while because his brother was the abbot in the uh, 10th century and 11th century. So we have a huge amount of history. You see, that's normal. You know, people, you're, you're listening to someone say, my God, it's your back garden. But you see, this is true. Right over within 15 feet of where I'm sitting, I have a fairy tree. And I this is the house I grew up in and I moved back into when my parents passed. And we had a fairy tree in our garden. Mm. because that was the way (laughs) (laughs) there's nothing to say only that's the way you know people would say but why would you have a fairy tree in your garden and the answer in Ireland is well sure that's the way Mm. so they they would be two very very um, important thin places but they're you know for me ultimately the deepest space of thinness is actually anywhere you go when you attune to what's available to you and some places have it stronger frequency wise and other places places have it weaker like a wood or or the seaside or the water the water is very important for me um because i suppose in ireland we'd consider the water to hold we'd be very available to the awareness of holding the movement of divine divine feminine the water holding that so i'd be very aligned to that quite naturally but mountains Mountains, not so much. I'm a bit of a lowland sort of gal. Uh, So anywhere I go, I'm basically attuning. I'm attuning to the people 
and I'm attuning to the energy of the land. And this morning I was working with alongside a lovely woman, a teacher of these. There's two schools. There's my daughter's school and another local school doing confirmation. And I said to my friend, Father Donna, afterwards, I said, where is that teacher from? Because I was naturally attuning to her energy. And he named uh, a wonderful place that she's from. And I said, that does not surprise me because I said there's it's in the Midlands, the place that, that she comes from. And I said, in the Midlands, they have a different way of connecting because they have to come up from the center and come out. So sometimes when you're naturally just falling into people's energy, uh, people from the center will, might have a little block and they, because they have to go through a different trajectory to come out to people but to us over in in where we come from we naturally fall into people which can be good and bad depending on where you're coming from yeah that's true so from a thin place point of view overall i would say everywhere is a thin place but some places have better frequencies than other than others because of their cultural history uh -huh. that would be my general uh kind of feedback on it but for me personally definitely in the and of course um the amethyst in the atlantic ocean Right. So when I was visiting there, um, I guess I don't know, last year or the year before, you took me to a place in the woods um, that was really special. Can you talk about that? OK, so um, I took you, Mindy, to Biddy Early's cottage. Now, Biddy Early was a woman who lived here locally in East Clare about 120 years ago, just in or around the 19th, 1900s, late, late 1800s, 19, 1900s. And she was from the area locally and she had three husbands and they all died, which, you know, set her up immediately as being questionable. Because if a woman surpassed her husband in those times, people would be questioning, you know, had she done something? to them to get rid of them. But I'm, I speak flippantly now because it's actually quite serious. The woman was uh, was well renowned because there would always be in every locale a medicine woman or a medicine man. And they would be outside the realms of the church quite often, but they would be an accepted, normalized. There was no veterinarians. There was no GPs. There was nothing like that. No structure of healthcare. So each tribe would have their own medicine woman. And these natural healers would be, um, you know, they'd usually come down. It would be a, a craft that would be handed down through families or basically it might just emerge. But anyway, Biddy Early was the local medicine woman of the time and everybody brought their animals and their children. And she had um, she had phenomenal ability to challenge the status quo of the time. And. I think after her third husband died, then things started to kind of go against her. So in this place where I brought you was the remains of her cottage. And all around her cottage are the white thorn, the thorn tree, the black thorn tree, the ash and the yew. All these trees, very, very important to the use of energy or the holding or the protection of energy around her house. Now, I've done many sacred rituals you know, from the point of view of bringing people there or just going there to be with the energy of myself because Biddy Early was became ostracized from her community because her, her power was so present and her honesty and her presence of power was something that the people became afraid of. And of course, you've got to understand that the times that were in it, people were becoming more modern and the priesthood had kind of, I suppose, created a fear of the feminine and women were usually quite often were, were the women were the healers. And um, so they went against her and they discredited her and, you know, proceeded to kind of make her a bit like the Salem trials, put her on trial as a witch. Now, the local priest was the leader of the posse, but at the same time, he did understand to a certain degree what she was at. So he came to warn her when they were coming for her, they were coming to do bad to her and to, to do wrong things to her. So she had a heads up and she had a lake behind her house, which is still there, the bridge where we crossed over and parked. And in that lake, Biddy, Biddy's, um, her cottage was on a hill. She threw all her medicine bottles 
really old bottles where she'd mix her herbs and all of that. And she threw them into the lake and the people came and she basically cursed them and said that because they would have had to be so fearful of what it was she was trying to give them, that the only way she could defend herself was through cursing them. And she made a very specific curse that played out until 1995. And that curse was that any any um, game, official game that would be played, any sport that would be played in the county would not ever be won by Clare until a certain amount of them were dead and a certain amount of them had risen to a certain understanding in themselves. And in 1995, that occurred. All those events kind of occurred in, in modern day language. And we won the Clare, we Clare won the All-Ireland for the first time in 83 years. So that was something that we, we saw ourselves in modern day, we saw ourselves as the curse lifting. But Biddy, luckily I was coming along about my business, my mother and I and my friend one time in the 90s. And we went visiting and with Biddy and with her energy and and luckily enough, there in the water waiting for me was one of Biddy's bottles. Wow. So I have that here in the house with uh, swan feathers in them that have come come to pass. But the point of Biddy in our collective consciousness is that Biddy was the wounded healer. And that can be an identity, especially for Irish people. We're deeply wounded and we're deeply grief stricken because tribally, We've been, you know, the Vikings came for us. The English came for us. Everybody came to take from us. Even St. Patrick, funnily enough, because we had our Celtic spirituality. We had our paganism. We we understood where the game was at. The sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, the land. We had a way where equality was able to prosper. People understood that, you know, men and women were equal. There was a beauty. And then, of course, Christianity arrived and all those things started to change and we began to become very vulnerable and away from the ancient knowings and that has left us very confused over time in terms of what our construction of meaning what is the meaning for us as people and we're deeply deeply aligned to this woundedness and out of course the, you know the deepest wound comes the greatest light and i'm quoting rumi here because the place that hurts you is also the place that heals you. So as an identity collectively, we Biddy Early is very much a symbol of the many wounded healers that we hold in our collective consciousness. But it's also very important to step away from that because that can be something that's easy to hang on to, like victimhood. So whereas I would have I would have understood the wounded healer and healed the wounded healer in myself. It is a natural alignment in the Celtic spirit to be wounded, but it is also important to let the light in and heal our wounds and move on from our wounds so that we can bring the memories of those wounds into a very transformational space so people can heal all around us. And we're endeavouring to do that in Ireland, I think, at a collective level, but it's very, very strong. We love to fight. We love to blame. We love to be victims. And we find it hard to step into the back into the ownership that we had a couple of thousand years ago where we understood the way it was and we were aligned with the way it was. And the isness of that alignment allowed the divinity to flow up through our feet and down through our heads and meet at our hearts in a way that was good for the land, good for the spirit and good for the earth. But, you know, we're coming back into that alignment generation by generation. And it's one of the fundamental, I suppose, tenets of my own life is to journey with that awareness and keep that flowing for myself, my family, and with the people personally and professionally that I work with in the various areas. That's great. What would you say to someone who is going to travel to one of these places? How would they, if you could recommend how they would prepare themselves spiritually, what, would, what kind of advice would you give to someone? Be in their body. Be in their body, because when you land in Ireland, I don't know if some of your your visitors that have, you've brought with you, Mindy, have, have noticed that when you come to Ireland, you are here, very here. You, you, you look out visually and you see the rocks and the stones and the sea and you feel the rain 
whether it's summer or winter, the rain will be present. And the energy of presence is in the air that you breathe. Your body in Ireland is here. It's like, it's a bit like the ancient folklore, you know, when, um, when what, what's that great man, I'm losing his name, who had to go back. Remember, he was taken to, to and he came back. Who's the wonderful, oh, the man that had to, he had to come back and he, when he came off the horse, remember? Oshin. Oshin, yeah. the wonderful Oshin. <laughs> I was a total, total mental block there. When Oshin came back to Ireland, you know, he'd been off in, in the great lands of fantasy and then he came back and, his, you know, when he got off the horse and he touched the land, he was an old man again. And it's a bit like that. I think there's a, there's a very good important lesson when we are here in Ireland be it the Irish people or any of our visitors because this is a land to be shared whether whether the Irish people or anybody else knows that the more we share this presence when people's bodies land in they land in with a welcome but they have to come into that welcome in their own bodies they have to be present with the rain present with the stones present with the availability of rain and and wind and character of personality because of course we're not quiet in ourselves we could be crying or laughing or joking or you know all sorts of things but if people are in their bodies then they're available to their own welcome and to their own journeys that allow the beauty of the thinness that we occupy normally every day for that to give them the information because everybody's coming with, I suppose, an agenda deep down in their psyche, whether they know it or not. They're coming to find a part of themselves because you will always find a truth in Ireland about yourself, whether it's about your family that you're finding out about, whether it's your own resilience, whether you're meeting your loss, meeting your, your history. There's many abundant, beautiful reasons to come to Ireland. But when you come, the deeper reason for your coming will become available to you and your body and you, your heart, your mind and your body need to be deeply, I suppose, maybe OK with that because it is a full on experience to be present with all that energy. Mm-hmm. And it's great fun and it's really alive, really alive. But it's also very, very important to be present and grounded in your body as you journey because it makes the beauty even more special and the, the personalities of people that you meet because we're very alive here. You know, we really, really are. We endeavor to share that aliveness with anybody we meet, be it be it our own people or anybody that comes to visit with us. Great. Do you have any other recommendations for travelers or anything else you'd like to say? Um, we in, in the part of the world that I come from um, we you know we have we have a wonderful we have a wonderful painful history and out of that painful history are some are some amazing beauties really like our our area and our people and our, our music and our folklore and our special you know special thin places and where we are is is we're kind of a little bit to we're in the kind of in what we call the sacred center of Ireland. So we're in the part of Ireland in East Clare. So you've got Clare, which goes all the way out to the coast in the middle of Ireland. And then you've got a very deep inward movement into the center of Ireland. And we're in that sacred center, which is the place where I suppose the truth of many things exists. And the consequence of that truth is an amazing landscape that I live and work with every day that I utilize for my own resilience. And I suppose one of the things, because we're not part of our, one of our famous places in County Clare, but it's out on the Atlantic Ocean, is the Cliffs of Moher. So the Cliffs of Moher is an, a very special place, but we have lots of places other than the ordinary special places that we have that people need to understand when you journey into the centre of anything, be it a land like Ireland, you will find a level of authenticity and a level of uh, creativity that oftentimes mightn't be present in the uh, the more um, explicit Cliffs and Moher, Dingle, Dublin, things like that. But if you're looking for something that's more nuanced, 
we have it and we have it in spades in terms of our fabulous places to visit and the beauty but I suppose I'd like to say that Mindy we're you know we're special and we can talk ourselves up fairly good if given the chance are you do you mean we as in County Clare or uh, as, as in yeah, County Clare, that's what I absolutely. thought just want to clarify that <laughs> Okay. But I speak generally for the collective we of Ireland. We're very good at talking ourselves up. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for spending this time with us. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll get you on again. It's always a joy. Um, best to you and Owen. And um, have, a, have a wonderful Easter holiday. Thank you, Mindy. And thank you for having me. It's been a great pleasure. Oh, you're most welcome. And now for a travel tip, I'm going to recommend two books um, that are great reads if you want to know more about Ireland and thin places. Um, one is an old, well, they're both old, um, a bestseller, How the Irish Saved Civilization by Thomas Cahill. Most people have heard of this book. Some may have even read it back when it was released. But Cahill does such an excellent job of telling the Irish history from the you know, pre-Christian, you know, pagan times, Stone Age, um, all the way up through the medieval times and the present day, all of the mythology is covered, um, and it is a wonderful way to. It, he identifies the Irish Irish charism that that element that is uniquely Irish that pervades their culture that makes them just a, a, a lover of words, a lover of language, as well as a mystical people. Um, it's a great read for understanding Irish history, and it's very entertaining. The other book was written a few years later, and it is now out of print. So, but I have a link to it on our show notes where you can get it through Amazon, through a used book dealer. It is called In the House of Memory, Ancient Celtic Wisdom for Everyday Life. And the author is Steve Raby. Steve has written a lot of good things um, out there about mystical places and earth energy. But just one paragraph, I think, kind of encapsulate what Steve is trying to get to, and I will read that to you. The Celts believed that specific physical sites were particularly convenient portals between the worlds. They referred to these as thin places, where the traffic between the worlds was thought to be especially heavy. Some thin places were sacred natural landscapes. Others were holy places of human construction, such as the tombs at Newgrange, stone circles like Stonehenge, or hundreds of smaller sacred sites scattered all over Europe. Whether the Celts stood in the middle of a stone circle or recited incantations in a wild grove, they felt that the gods were close at hand, that they and the divine were one. That's just a little snippet of what Steve tries to prove throughout the book. And he mentions many sacred sites and saints and spiritual practices. Um, and there are some very nice photographs in it as well. So if you like Thin Places and want to know more about Ireland, those are two great books. Um, I thank you for listening today. And I encourage you to subscribe to us on iTunes visit the website, which is thinplacespodcast.com for the show notes and more about some of the things that we talked about um, on this podcast. Next podcast episode, episode two, we'll be talking to Annie Conboy. She lives in England. She is a healer and she'll be talking about earth energy and kind of how to harness that and connect with it. And I will be bringing you more information about thin places in Northern Ireland. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to check out our tours to mystical sites at thinplacestour.com. The music for this podcast is Native Spirit, performed by Cheryl Ann Fulton from her collection, The Once and Future Harp. Goodbye for now. Wishing you love and light and every blessing.